Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this afternoon's 2011 Erasmus Society Lecture in Philosophy here at Westmont. Our speaker today is Dr. Terry Merrick, who's Professor of Philosophy and Head of the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Azusa Pacific University. Uh, Dr. Merrick earned her BA in Philosophy at uh, Cal State University at Fullerton and her MA and PhD degrees in Philosophy at the University of California at Irvine uh, in its Distinguished Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science. Uh, this is a particularly... Um, it's a particularly distinguished unit in her fields of interest, which are history of analytic philosophy, philosophy of mathematics and logic, uh, and German philosophy, especially the philosophies of Immanuel Kant and Gottlob Frege. Uh, Dr. Merrick uh, is, uh, was named a Dean's Emerging Scholar at APU in 2006 and 2008, and she's published a number of articles um, with really intriguing sounding titles. So for example, in the uh, 2010 Christian Scholars Review, there's one entitled Teaching Philosophy, Instilling Pious Wonder or Vicious Curiosity. Uh, uh, she's published an article on naturalism uh, in a collection edited by uh, Ord by Cambridge Scholars Press entitled Naturalism, a Crude Instrument in the Search for a Beloved. Uh, and then uh, uh, another title I like, in Philosophy Mathematica, what Frege meant when he said, Kant is right about geometry. <laughs> uh, so as I say, a, 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 a wide range of topics and tantalizing sounding titles. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Merrick is a specialist in uh, philosophy of mathematics, history of analytic philosophy, German philosophy, uh, particularly Kant and Frege. And to be honest, this is one of the reasons that we uh, we're keen to invite her up here. Uh, for whatever reason, Christians do not tend to work in these areas. I mean, there, most of you will know there's been a remarkable uh, resurgence of, a fluorescence of uh, philosophical work of a very high order done by Christians in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, for whatever reason, a lot of it, however, has been done in metaphysics, work very, of a very high order, in epistemology, work of a very high order. Uh, um, but technical subjects like philosophy of mathematics, philosophical logic, there just hasn't been as much by Christians. Um, and interestingly, while Christians have taken up as philosophical models uh, people like historical figures like Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, Descartes and Berkeley, they've been leery about picking up and working with uh, Kant as a model uh, for Christian philosophizing. Now, there's some interesting reasons for that, but I, 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 uh, but I don't know that they're decisive. Um, I can only think of one, maybe two, well-known Christian philosophers who work on Kant. So uh, it was because Professor Merrick stands out as someone who works in these areas, uh, but uh, 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 as a professing Christian, that we were interested to hear from her. Now, um, her topic today is equally interesting and tantalizing. Since the time of the Enlightenment, we have been told that objectivity is a good thing, especially for thinkers and researchers who should try to be scientific, uh, try to get at how things really are and not just at how they seem uh, to you to be at any given moment. So you're supposed to trust observation over intuition and prejudice. You're supposed to shun value judgments and aim at value-free description. You're supposed to embrace quantitative and formal techniques instead of woolly impressionism. I mean, who would want to be a woolly impressionist? Um, well, uh, you know, and you might say, who, who, who doesn't want to be objective? Well, a lot of people, as it happens. From the middle of the 20th century, this ideal of objectivity has been met with wave after wave of criticism from social scientists and philosophers and literary critics and cultural theorists. Now, uh, I'm going to leave it to Professor Merritt to tell us what's so bad about it. But um, here's a sample. So Richard Rorty, uh, in one of his volumes, says, these distinctions between hard facts and soft values, truth and pleasure, and objectivity and subjectivity are awkward and clumsy instruments. They are not suited to dividing up culture. They create more difficulties than they resolve. That's very typical of a kind of um, 
approach to thinking about objectivity in the academy these days. Um, so uh, Dr. Merrick's lecture is entitled, Be Objective. Well, I changed it. Oh, oh, <laughs> excellent. Well, let me tell you what her lecture title what? was. The lecture title was, Be Objective, a Post-Christian Modernist Imperial Command, question mark. Okay, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Terry Merrick. Thank you very much. I really appreciate coming. Um, and I'm going to, this, I, this is the first time I've ever used PowerPoint, so I'm very nervous about it, but, um, but hopefully it'll go well. Um, and I'm going to hewn closely to my text here, just because I want to give us plenty of time. I've timed it, it's 45 minutes, um, but if I go off on rabbit trails, Lord knows how long I can talk. And so, and I want to leave a lot of time um, for you all to address some of these questions, because honestly, this is a very speculative paper on my part, and, um, and so I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, so why spend an hour or more of our time trying to clarify what the word objectivity means? The first reason I'll offer is that beings like us Beings who can reflect on the meanings of words should engage in this kind of reflection. So right off the bat, I seem to be committing a kind of fallacy, the fallacy that can implies ought. But to see that in practice we do assume a close connection between rational agency, linguistic competency, and linguistic or discursive obligations, consider what I take to be a fairly generalizable account of childhood training. As soon as my children, and now my grandchild, started using words, they were commanded to use them. If Tilly wants her sippy cup of juice and starts to whine or cry or push somebody to get, at, to get at it, which she often does, she hears us say, use your words, use your words. So in our family, and I would argue in the social move that a lot of us operate in, the assumption that someone is capable of using language and understanding it goes hand in hand with the assumption that they're obliged to use it and to do so in a manner reinforcing the claim that we're a community of rationally motivated creatures, owing it to each other and to ourselves to provide reasons for doing what we do. Now the account I've, oh, it worked. The account I've sketched so far about what's involved in acknowledging something as a discursive rational creature is an account that I've borrowed from 18th and 19th century German philosophers Kant and Hegel. Robert Brandon, I just love this man's beard. <laughs> this is a true philosopher. Robert Brandon, a contemporary American philosopher, describes this account as the crowning achievement of German idealism, and he summarizes it as follows. Kant and Hegel dis distinguish discursive beings from merely natural ones. We're social, normative, rational, free, and self-consciously historical animals. To be rational, to be a rational being in this sense is to be subject to a distinctive kind of normative appraisal. Rational beings are ones that ought to have reasons for doing what they do, and they ought to act as they have reason to. They are subjects of rational obligations, prohibitions, and permissions. For Brandom and for me, Kant and Hegel should be credited with realizing that a complete description of human beings must acknowledge that we're not merely natural beings that occupy a spatio-temporal realm that's ordered by a realm of causally related agents and, e and events, but also discursive beings that are responsible for and respond to a realm of inferentially related attitudes, assertions, and activities. Brandon refers to this realm of inferentially related entities as the space of reasons wherein we live and move and have our being. For both theological and philosophical reasons, I prefer the more modest, a discursive practice or tradition. Still, I agree that while it may be true that natural beings can be adequately understood by explaining their constitution and behavior relative to a grand theory of descriptive causal laws, and I say may because we don't know yet whether this is possible, um, this is certainly not enough when it comes to understanding discursive beings, beings like us. A complete explanation of our behavior must include an evaluative component that evokes prescriptive laws and norms that identify rationally motivated actions and assertions. For a general idea of what some of these prescriptive norms might be, let me tell you about a disagreement that my husband and I had about where we parked the car. <laughs> this shows that we don't always have disagreements there, I figured. Um, and he read this, by the way. So, Don't marry or be the child of a philosopher, you will be referenced so many times. So at the end of a basketball game, we came out of a, an arena and didn't immediately remember where we'd parked the car. So this is a true story. Um, 
I said, it's over there, and pointed to the right. And Jeff said, no, it's over there, and pointed to the left. Um, we were with a friend, and so we kept talking about other things as we walked to the car. Once we got there, one of us, and I can't remember who it was, said, see, it was where I said it was. And the other one said, what are you talking about? It was where I said it was. And believe it or not, um, so we asked our friend to you know, settle the matter, and he wisely declined. So we ended up arguing about this for the entire 20-minute ride home. No joke. Um, when we got home, my husband decided that it was high time that I was confronted with my stubborn refusal ever to admit when I was wrong. So he got out a piece of paper and drew a map um, oriented by the, by the uh, a clock where the or north was oriented of the arena. And he said, you tell me where you think it was. Because he knew that once I got there, I would change my mind. I mean, this is how much we love and believe in one another. Um, so I said, OK, it was at 1 o'clock. He said it was at 11 o'clock. And believe it or not, we drove all the way back um, in uh, pouring rain to see who was right. <laughs> now, what accounts for this behavior? Um, surely a lot of things, including the fact that you've got two stubborn people trying to live together. Um, but I insist that a complete description of these events must also include the fact that Jeff and I were holding each other accountable to certain norms governing the actions of rationally responsible agents. One of these norms goes something like this. If you report having had a perception of an object at a specific space-time location, and you infer that this perception warrants the assertion that the thing really was at that location, then you've committed yourself to the thing actually being there, and also to certain rules and procedures whereby others can hold you accountable for that commitment. A commonly recognized procedure for settling disputes over where something was is for both parties to go back and check. And so this is what we did. In short, Jeff and I were acting as Brandon's discursive beings do, beings recognizing themselves as subjects of rational obligations towards the purported content of their representations to perceive and judge this content correctly and to one another in submitting to procedures for reconciling incompatible representations. I also want to underscore Brandon's claim that deciding something is subject to rational norms for what it does or does, says or does, is equivalent to treating it as a fellow rational being. Taking something to be subject to appraisals of its reasons, holding it rationally responsible, is treating it as someone, as one of us. If some creature never, and we had never, <laughs> never acts as it has reason to, is entirely unmoved by reasons, is completely insensitive to relations of rational consequent and incompatibility among its attitudes, goals, and performances, then there might simply be no point in holding it responsible or treating it as a rational agent or know it at, know it at all. Now, I want to be careful that I've used this. I'm not saying they're not a person, OK? Um, and again, this is where I go off and I've got to watch my time. But when I, was, when I was writing this, I was actually thinking, I thought about Tilly and how she screams for her apple juice. And then I thought about being at a grocery store. And if someone came and just pushed me out of the way to grab like a gallon, right? I mean, I, my reaction would be, hey, what? You know, like, and they would need to have some reason to explain their behavior. But I don't know if you've ever, I've been in a store where um, there was someone that was autistic. And they clearly almost couldn't tell the difference between shopping carts and people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say that they don't, they're not people, that they don't have certain kinds of rights. But it seems clear that I'm not going to hold them accountable for reason giving in the same way I, I hold my three-year-old granddaughter to that. So in recognition of our joint status, oh, I'm sorry. See, this is why you don't go off. So what if Jeff never held me accountable for what I claimed to have seen or heard, but simply smiled as one sometimes does with a small child and said, I'm sure you that the car appeared to you as if it was on the right, dear, and then went on his very way. For my part, I would prefer being dragged out in the pouring rain at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday night and thus affirmed as a full-fledged member in Jeff's community of rational agents. So in recognition of our joint status as rational beings in a discursive tradition that has been significantly shaped by philosophers like Kant and Hegel, like it or not, and in light of the fact that one of the things we do in this tradition is to invoke the term objective and its cognates to evaluate whether someone is reasoning responsibly, I propose we are obligated to offer good reasons for continuing to use this term or to strike it from our vocabulary, as Rorty says. Although by the time I define objectivity, one of my colleagues says it comes awful close to Rorty, so he's a little worried. The second reason warranting a closer look at the meaning of objectivity is that it has been used to pick out rational obligations that have been applied so as to deny women, non-whites, and non-Europeans full and equal participation in discursive practices that significantly impact their lives. In fact, Kant and Hegel have been accused of deploying the notion of objectivity in just this way. So since I intend to defend the continued and normative use 
of a Kantian conception of objectivity, we need to examine why Kant and Hegel are guilty as charge. By the end of my lecture, I hope to have accomplished these three things. Um, and I have to warn the students that are here for extra credit. Number one is going to be a tedious going through of Kantian texts. But it's okay, because we get to number two, um, which is explain how this notion became an unduly masculized, racialized concept, even those terms just sound enticing, um, so as not to perpetuate this problem. And then hopefully three, and this is what I'm really hoping to do, is just introduce some sufficiently provocative questions so that we can have a good discussion afterward. Because honestly, I have as many questions as if I had answers on this. To get a grip on Kant's notion of objectivity, we need to see its relationships within a entire family of contrasted concepts. And it'll be helpful to have some key quotes from Kant's original text ready at hand. So again, it's going to be helpful if you have them there. So I'm going to read through all, uh, several of these, and then I'll unpack them for you. A perception that refers to the subject as a modification of its state is a sensation. Objective perception is a cognition. Subjectively valid judgments hold only for us, for our subject, and only afterwards do we give them a new relation, namely to an object, and intend that the judgment should hold also valid, should hold valid also for us and for everyone else. Judgments of experience will not derive their objective validity, and don't worry if you don't understand this stuff, just read through it and I'm going to unpack it from immediate cognition of the object, for this is impossible, but on a pure concept of the understanding. Objective validity and necessary universal validity for everyone are therefore interchangeable concepts. Taking something to be true is an occurrence in our understanding that may rest on objective grounds, but that also requires subjective causes in the mind of him who judges. If it, the judgment, is valid for everyone, merely as long as he has reason, then its ground is objectively sufficient. And in that case, taking something to be true is called conviction. If, it's ground, if it has its ground in the particular constitution of the subject, then it is called persuasion. The touchstone of whether taking something to be true is a conviction, therefore, externally, is the possibility of communicating it and finding it to be valid for the reason of every human being to take it to be true. So the first thing to notice is that for Kant, the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity maps onto the contrast between particularity and universality. Subjectively valid, subjective perceptions refer to and are grounded on the individual's experience and her state changes. Subjectively valid judgments refer to and are grounded on the contingent particularities of a knowing subject. So we can think of these kinds of judgments as including first person reports of one's representational state. So I saw the car to the right, I think the car was to the right, I remember the car being to the right. Now according to Kant, every judgment has an implied I think as a part of its form. It's for, don't worry about form. I never know what that is either. But, but the difference between a subjectively valid content is the reference to the particular knowing subject is part of the judgment's content. I think it was here. I remember it being there. And this then determines the judgment's scope of validity. When asserting a subjectively valid judgment, I'm asserting a judgment about my particular situation and my constitution. And the judgment can only hold true, if it holds true at all, for those that are in that particular situation. Khan himself, gives two examples of subjectively valid judgments. Judgments grounded on a person's psychologically associated mental states and judgments that are based on a private, personal experience of divine holiness. For the philosophers in the audience, the upshot is that asserting one of David Hume's matters of fact will not count as a warranted objectively valid knowledge claim. Kant explicitly denies this or draws this conclusion. A conclusion that we might want to draw for him is that one of Alvin Plantinga's basic beliefs will be similarly unwarranted. I think that follows. Um, given Kant's distinction between subjectively valid and objectively valid judgments, an individual's experience of God's presence may warrant the assertion that God spoke to me today, or I'm persuaded that God is good. But such experiences do not qualify as objectively sufficient grounds warranting the assertion of a claim like God is good, where the presumption is that we intend to be talking not about our particular representations of God or our particular experiences of God, but about God as a possible object of human cognition, universal human cognition, and where the asserted judgment is one we expect all rational human beings to take as true. So in order to ascribe objective validity, 
to our representation or perceptions and judgments. Kant insists that we go beyond the particularities of individualistic or context-specific representation. <clears throat> that is, he wants an explanation as to what entitles us to bridge the gap from between the subjectively valid, I perceive, remember the car to be the, to the right of the re arena, and the objectively valid, the car is to the right of the arena. And here's the way he puts it. How does the representation go beyond itself and acquire the objective significance in addition to the subjective significance that is proper to it as a determination in the state of mind? In other words, how do I get to be able to say what I am perceiving is something that you too <laughs> ought to perceive as being there? How does it get that kind of objective significance? Now, one of the ways that um, people have tried to meet Kant's demand was by, um, is with a causal explanation of perceptual and judgmental content. An explanation where you would be able to distinguish the features of the content of the representation, what's given to me by external stimuli versus what's a contribution of my own psychophysiology. So this is one way actually a guy, Herman Helmholtz, he wants to say, okay, well, what's objective in my representation? What, what's objective is whatever I can trace causally to something out there as opposed to tracing it to something in me. But given the account of objectivity that I'm interested in, this causal account is irrelevant. For on the account that I want to promote, to say that a perception or judgment is objective is to say that it bears a normatively necessary relationship to the content it purports to represent. And this normativity cannot be secured by recounting the causal factors resulting in a particular individual having had a particular perception or judgment. Instead, to treat my perception of the car's spatial location at time t as an objective perception is to treat it as permissible warrant for asserting an objectively valid judgment. I've implicitly committed myself not merely to the claim that I perceive the car to be there, but that I correctly perceive the car to be there, and that other people's perceptions and judgments and assertions should be compatible with my own. I want Jeff to agree with me <laughs> and correct his perception or remember, re recollected perception. Kant himself tried to secure the normative necessity of representations by showing that their content was derivable from a fixed and complete table of pure concepts and propositions. Concepts and propositions that all rationally reasonable humans would recognize as the rules for deriving propositions that ought to be taken as true. The conclusion of Kant's derivation is that Newtonian mechanics ends up being the paradigmatic body, so any subjectively valid representation about nature that alleges to be objective should be compatible with the consistent development of modern Newtonian science. We don't think about this much, but really honestly think about it. I love to do this with my students. How, how fast are we moving right now? Real fast. <laughs> oh, come on. Why isn't this flying off? <laughs> okay, but see, notice now what's happening. We're letting science be the judge of our, our perceptions. We don't trust our perceptions unless they com are compatible with recent sciences. Given the revolutions in math, logic, and physics at the turn of the 20th century, philosophers of science realized that Kant's table of a priori principles needed to be relativized and historicized. We're no longer sure about Newtonian mechanics. We're not even sure about anything. For this and other reasons, it's great when the physicists are in worse, much more conflictual positions than philosophers. <laughs> For this and other reasons, I'm going to follow Hegel and those neo-Kantians who reject Kant's claim that the table of concepts and principles conferring normative necessity on a representation is complete and unrevisable. Nevertheless, I want to, they and I want to retain his insight that objective validity and necessary universal validity I'm sorry, objectively and necessary universal validity are interchangeable concepts. Discovering the complete set of the concepts and principles that confer this validity and necessity is, like the idealized end of science, an arduous ongoing work in progress. Finally, we need to note one more implication that Kant derives from his account of objectivity. It must be possible to communicate and publicly scrutinize the circumstances or reasoning giving rise to an alleged objectively valid representation. It is because Kant takes communicability to be a necessary mark of objectivity that experiencing God's holiness cannot serve as an objectively sufficient ground for moral claims. And let me, I'm gonna read this in full because it's important. 
Um, investigations into all forms of faith that relate to religion invariably run across a mystery behind their inner nature, something holy, which can indeed be cognized by every individual, yet cannot be professed publicly, and, and the, the italics are his own. It cannot be communicated universally. We shall not be allowed to count among the holy mysteries the grounds of morality which are inscrutable to us, but only what is given to us in cognition, yet is not susceptible of public disclosure. For morality allows of open communication, even though its cause is not given to us. Thus freedom, the property which is made manifest through the determination of his power of choice by the unconditional law, is no mystery, since cognition of it can be communicated to everyone. Now here and elsewhere, Kant maintains that the ultimate ground of morality, the first cause of the free and rational will that distinguishes us as discursive beings, is entirely inscrutable to us and cannot be an object of cognition. But in this passage, he claims that religious mysteries, including, and he specifies this, including the mystery that God willingly imputes Christ's righteousness to us, this can be an object of our cognition. Individuals gain cognitive access to these propositional objects by inspecting the inner subjective part of their moral predispositions. But since the content of this moral introspection is not susceptible to universal communication, public profession, and scrutiny, these cognitions remain subjectively valid, one, in, subjectively valid ones. Um, drawing inferences and um, developing. Um, actually, this comes out in terms of um, mathematics. If I'm trying to do a proof, um, I become aware of my ability to um, um, imagine certain kinds of configurations and see what follows from them. Um, and he thinks we have. And he thinks this is spontaneous. Right? These are these are not caused. And we can cause new representations. Um, they come from us. And so what he says then is that this freedom and the fact of myself as a free agent is something that I can become aware of in myself. But because of this concept is also one that can be universally communicated, publicly perfect, and scrutinized, therefore it can serve as objectively valid ground for determining judgments. For which ones are ethical, which assertions are warranted, and which actions are morally obligatory. So again, communicability here and public profession becomes a key for anything that you want to take as a potentially objectively valid claim or perception. Now, it's not entirely clear from this passage alone why Kant thinks that the immediate cognitive awareness of divine holiness can only ground subjectively valid claims, like the claim that I tarry in the sinner in God, need of God's grace, and not an objective interpretation or rendering of the claim that all have sinned and are equally needy. It is even less clear whether we should agree that such claims could not meet Kant's criteria for asserting objectively sufficient judgments. So I think it's, I mean, he claims that they're not publicly communicable and discernible. I'm not sure that's the case. But we can postpone these <coughs> questions for now because I want to summarize, and this is where I really wish I did have a thing, but we've got the, the handout. So. so now I just want to summarize the modified Kantian notion of objectivity that I'm endorsing. So this would be number 11 and number 12. So this is what I mean by objectivity. Representations are candidates for objective validity only if their purported content is intersubjectively accessible, meaning that this content must be translatable across persons, cultures, and generations. Candidates for objectivity must be subject to public scrutiny, applying universally recognized rules and procedure for determining whether the representation correctly presents this content. So I need to be able to say the car is there. Jeff needs to be able to understand what I said. We need, then need to have some sort of universal, or at least some recognized public norm for deciding when we have incompatible representations, which one's correct. Now acquiring, so number 12, acquiring objective knowledge is thus an inherently social enterprise with significant social and political implications. And I think you can see how that follows. If it has to be publicly communicated, if we have to have norms that we're going to hold one another accountable to, this acquisition of this kind of knowledge is going to be inherently social. And the rules and procedures conferring objective necessity on our representations are themselves now going to be open to revision. 
So one of the reasons Kanban fills his body uh, principles that, and they were fixed for all time. Um, and those were up for negotiation. Yeah. Um, and he thought that he knew them and other people knew them, some. And so one didn't really have to go out and check. <laughs> um, you could apply them and that would give you and confer a certain kind of objective necessity and universality and representations. Um, as I said, um, one of the things we learned have to be really wrong about what those were. Um, we thought Euclidean geometry was universal and necessary. This is exactly what happened, um, but it, lo and behold, it wasn't. Um, so these things can be revised and changed, and, I, I, and for that reason, I think number four, acquiring objective knowledge is best viewed as a regulative ideal towards which some discursive practices and practitioners should strive, but no one can lay claim to having actually attained them. Despite these modifications, I credit Kant with articulating a notion of objectivity that designates norms that are worth retaining, norms that are compatible with the postmodern, and dare I say, Christian recognition. It's not surprising, therefore, that philosophers especially attuned to the perspectival socio-historical character of knowledge acquisition have proposed similar notions of objectivity. Now, what I'm doing here, and this is number 13, I'm just running you through different people who have, who have endorsed notions of objectivity that are similar to my own. So Donna Haraway, do you see her little picture? Mm -hmm. Okay. And other feminist epistemologists have argued that given the limited and perspectival nature of all knowing, the most we can hope for is forms of knowledge that are translatable across particular subjective locations. Philosopher of science, Helen Longineau, argues that a discursive community should be regarded as objective and credited with producing objective knowledge so long as it can meet the following criteria. It offers a public venue for the criticism of knowledge claims. It responds to criticism by changing its theories according to three publicly recognized standards of evaluation. And four, it follows a norm of equality of intellectual authority among its members. Now, one of the things you should see that's happened here is that under this definition, uh, the acquisition of uh, the agent of, of knowledge here is actually a community and not an individual. Lastly, and this is where we bring in other people like Frege, um, Frege, founding father to number 15 of formal modern logic and analytic philosophy, over a century ago, Frege raised concerns that the universal communicability and normative necessity that are the hallmark of genuine scientific discourse were being threatened by revolutionary changes in the mathematical practice. So what you had going on at this time was just radical changes in um, geometry, specifically, and definitions of the point that no longer sounded anything like the way we had used point when we were talking in Euclidean geometry. And what Frege was worried about was that you all were using the same terms, and practitioners were using the same terms, the meanings of these terms had radically changed. And there wasn't any collective communicability, and, there was, and you had, it was really presaging Kuhnian words um, about incommensurability. So to address these concerns, he urged a return to the Kantian notion of objectivity, <coughs> similar to the one that I've just described. And here's Frege. What is objective is what is subject to laws, what can be conceived and judged, what is expressible in words, Subjective ideas are often demonstrably different for different men. Objective ideas are the same for all. For Frege, objective ideas are entities that compose the content of asserted judgments that are derived at least in part from laws that lay claim to universal validity and normative necessity. This Kantian notion of objectivity plays a key role in Frege's argument that nonsensical non-causal natural numbers are just as objective as any of the entities that are studied in natural science. If you think that objectivity can only be ensured by direct having some sort of causal connection to the reference, then twos don't tend to hit you on the face. Um, and so this was one, really was one of his arguments. He, he had to change the notion of objectivity in a sense to think that numbers are just as objective as atoms or whatever. But notice though, Okay, so any concept of objectivity that's endorsed by philosophers from these diverse backgrounds and these diverse aims as Kant, Haraway, Longino, and Frege, I think is worthy of serious consideration before we throw it out in the bathwater with other prototypical Enlightenment notions. Notice, though, that it doesn't follow from anything I've said so far that we're obligated to subject all of our perceptions and judgments to the tests that Kant requires for presumably objectively valid ones, so but I have to make them, I have to communicate them, I have to open them up to public scrutiny, and almost
almost universal public release in principle. Kant maintained that no amount of introspection can alert us to the difference between acquiring privately valid grounds persuading us of the truth of a matter and acquiring objectively sufficient reasons that ought to convict us of its truth. And I have to say, um, um, this was certainly true when Jeff and I were having this argument. I mean, both of us were equally convinced that we had seen the thing in a particular way. And bizarrely enough, both of us were equally convinced that when we got to there, it was where each of us had said. Okay? So consequently, we, we, introspection isn't going to be able to tell us the difference. This is one of the reasons we have to communicate to one another. He then recommends the universal public scrutiny test is a kind of experiment, that's what he calls it, to see if the grounds that are valid for us really do have the same effect on other people. But he doesn't say, and I was surprised at this, that I have to perform this experiment on all those things that strike me as deeply held convictions. Instead, he says this, we'll turn to uh, number 16 now. I'm glad he said this, because I meant I could agree with him. Um, I cannot assert anything pronounce it to be in the judgment necessarily valid for everyone, except that which produces conviction. I can preserve persuasion for myself, however, if I'm pleased to do so, but cannot and should not want to make it, make it valid beyond myself. So he draws a distinction between the kinds of things that I can assert as alleged claims that everyone ought to hold as true versus those subjectively valid ones that I'm persuaded of. And he doesn't say that I have to submit all of my deeply held convictions to this public scrutiny task. Now, it seems to me that there are matters about which I am entirely persuaded, where it is permissible and even preferable to refrain from subjecting them to public scrutiny tests. Submitting a claim like Jeff loves me, for example, to public scrutiny and publicly recognized standards of evaluation seems like a betrayal to our relationship and the intimate interactions currently serving as the subjective grounds for this claim. I mean, I, I, and this is just an intuition. Um, you know, Hawkins do not believe in unconceptualized intuitions. Um, but it is an intuition. I just think, I can imagine how Jeff would feel if I went around trying to make sure that you all agreed with me that Jeff loved me. Huh. Um, now this raises a question that I really would love to explore in the Q&A um, about what types of representations and which discursive practices ought to be made subject to Kant's experiment. But the question I'll address now is why we should feel motivated to subject any of our convictions to this experiment. Why should any of us care about asserting judgments whose validity extends beyond ourselves or our like-minded friends and colleagues? Why should I care if you agree with me? To appreciate the force behind Kantian imperative reason objectively, I need to introduce one more conceptual contrast autonomy versus heteronomy. For Kant, acting or reasoning autonomously is to act or reason according to laws or standards that one would legislate as binding on themselves and on other discursive things. So this would to operate autonomously. I'm going to operate under those laws that I myself seem to be valid and that I would hold you accountable to as well. Acknowledging the capacity of human beings to reason autonomously when formulating scientific, political, and ethical propositions is equivalent to expressing the dignity that is their due. So this is number 17, the quote. Every rational being, as an end in itself, must be able to regard himself as also giving universal laws with respect to any whatsoever to which he may be subject. For it is, oh, for it is just this fitness of his maxims for giving universal law that marks him out as an end in itself. It follows that this dignity, this prerogative, that he has over all natural beings, that he must always take the point of view of himself and likewise every other rational being. Notice, oh, are we gonna, are we gonna try to fix this? If you want to. Yeah, yeah. In fact, this is perfect time because I have questions that I want. Okay. This is why. The PowerPoint. But hopefully you guys have been able to track with me. Have you been able to track? Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Okay. And I know this has been the tedious part, but it really, it really does have to, I mean, it, it's important, I think. Um, so let me click through some of this now. Oh, there, good. You can see their little face. Well, next. So there's Frig. Uh, God love the man. Um, when and why go public? So this was, it helps if you, this is the question. When do I have to go public with my convictions and why? 
And again, I really, this is very important to me. I don't know if anyone else cares about this question. This question about which, because I think Kant has reason. I, I think, I think, not, not, I, might, I think there might be good reasons why a claim like, you know, Terry is a sinner in need of God's grace really ought not be the kind of thing that we try to publicly scrutinize. I have really good friends that love me very much and family. And if I, if I ask them, am I a sinner? They usually say, oh no, you're so sweet. But I know differently. So where are we now? Yes, okay, so here's what he says, okay? That, so the question that I was raising is, why should I be motivated to ever then sort of take my convictions and bring that to you all to make sure that you think that the reasons that I have for holding them are good ones? And here's what he says, that it's part of the respect that we ought to have for one another's autonomy. And that part of re respecting that autonomy in ourselves brings with it a, a responsibility to bring as many perspectives to bear as possible on the convictions that we hold. Matters presumed to have objective significance. By contrast, acting or reasoning heteronymously for Kant is to forsake this responsibility and to conduct ourselves as if we can only be motivated by involuntary, externally originating causal forces or to let others do our thinking for us. So autonomy is to act in a self-determined way because I have decided this is the right thing to do. Whereas acting heteronymously is just, so imagine me kicking and screaming and Jeff dragging me back to check. But me saying, no, this is right. I need to go back and we need to check and see who's right. The motivation and obligation to pursue Kantian ideal of objective reasoning then derives from the same source, the dignity and respect due to human beings as discursive beings and to actualizing the kinds of communities in which they can flourish. Individuals or discursive practices that never subject their deeply held convictions to Kant's proposed experiment for objectively valid judgments would fail to show proper respect for the dignity that's conferred on natural beings endowed with a free and rational will. So it's my respect for you as rational beings and your right to autonomous thinking. That means that I would, at least with some of my convictions, and it was my respect, and I think it was just respect for me, to say no. We're going to go back and find out whether we're right or wrong. Okay, having come full circle, back to the distinction between discursive beings and mere natural beings, we are finally in a position to answer these questions. Number one, how did the Kantian Enlightenment ideal of objective reasoning become associated with white male European kind of reasoning? So we've all heard about this. We're tired of listening to dead white men. Um, but, you know, there's, it really did, and there's reasons for that. Can we, should we disassociate the two? Can we strip Kantian objectivity from its association with male, white, Eurocentric kind of reasoning? And should we? Three, if we can't do that, should we continue to uphold Kantian objectivity as a regulative ideal governing any of the discursive practices at a place like Westmont or APU? And finally, are there other reasons for jettisoning Kantian objectivity as a regulative ideal? Now, I'm just gonna, I have, some, a bit of time remaining, so I'm going to go through a kind of a cursory answer to these questions, and I'm going to take them in reverse order. So number four is for you all. Okay. You will decide at the end of my talk whether or not this is something worth worrying about at all. Um, my answer to number three is no. Um, if we can't disassociate this, co this concept of objectivity um, from male, uh, a certain kind of, you know, males think this way, women do not, um, then we shouldn't be holding it up anymore. And obviously, given what I've talked about my argument so far, my answer to number two has to be obviously yes. We should try to disassociate the two, and I certainly hope that we can, or this lecture has been an exercise in futility. Um, with an eye toward making this disassociation, then let me conclude with a partial explanation. There's a whole lot that goes into this, but a partial explanation as to how Kantian objectivity became a masculinized and racialized concept. Kant and Hegel developed their account of rationally responsible discursive human beings while simultaneously subscribing to a complementarian account of male and female virtue. Generally speaking, complementarian accounts hold that God and nature intend for men and women to fulfill different complementary social roles. 
Typically, women are assigned the role of child bearer, child rearer, um, caregivers, homemakers, and managers, and men are assigned the roles of provider, protector, decision maker, and leader for family or society as a whole. Since males and females are designed for different functions, they ought to develop different complementary virtues or traits, enabling them to best perform these functions. Now, in the Republic, surprisingly, um, Plato rejects a complementarian account of male and female nature. There is no way of life concerned with the management of city that belongs to women because she's a woman or to man because she's a man. But the various natures are distributed in the same way in both creatures. Women share in every way of life just as men do, but in all of them, women are weaker than men. Now, depending on how you read that weaker, um, I read it, at least in this text, is just physically weaker. I, I just think it's, and he's right about that for the most part. Um, although I go to CrossFit and there's, this, there's some of these women that are amazing. Um, more surprisingly, and I think this is really surprising, Kant affirms it. So the great liberal egalitarian. Um, he writes as if women and men do have different natures or at least differing natural aptitudes. And I'm going to read this and, and we'll get through it. Since nature, he says, also wanted to instill the finer feelings that belong to culture, namely those of sociability and propriety, it made the female sex man's ruler through her modesty and eloquence in speech and expression. It made her clever while still young in claiming gentle and courteous treatment by a male so that he would find himself imperceptibly fettered by a child through his own magnanimity and led by her, if not to morality itself, to that which is its cloak, moral decency. Feminine virtue or lack of virtue is different from masculine virtue or lack of virtue, not only in kind but also in regards to incentive. She should be patient. He must be tolerant. She is sensitive. He is sentimental. The man has his own taste. The woman makes herself the object of everyone's taste. The problem here is that the virtues, talents, and inclinations that Kant identifies as characteristically feminine ones are not obviously conducive to becoming a recognizably mature discursive being that is capable of collaborating with her peers in pursuit of objective knowledge. Remember, the objective reasoner is one manifesting sufficient respect for our collective capacity for autonomous reasoning. And Kant correctly points out that manifesting this respect requires cultivating the intellectual virtues of diligence and courage. This is a lovely quote. We should read it and memorize it and cite it to ourselves all the time, especially now. Laziness and cowardice are the reasons why such a large proportion of men gladly remain immature for life. If I have a book to have an understanding in place of me, a spiritual advisor to have a conscience for me, a doctor to judge my diet for me, and so on. I need not make any efforts at all. I need not think so long as I can pay. Others will soon enough take the tiresome job from me. The guardians who have kindly taken it upon themselves, the work of supervision, will soon see to it that by far the largest part of mankind, including the entire fair sex, should consider the step forward to maturity not only as difficult, but also highly dangerous. Now here, Kant admits that socio-political structures of his day make it especially difficult for women to incur the risks and responsibilities of a mature, discursive being that is capable of thinking for herself. Yet he never engages in a sustained critique of these structures and tends to reinforce them. How is the oft-repeated and specific injunction to women that they ought to exercise modesty and gentility in speech, supposed to encourage them to participate in a public critique of the reasoning presented by culturally authorized texts and guardians. So remember, the objective reasoner is supposed to get out there and bring her in and argue. And, and, and it's just, it's, these things are not incompatible with one another, but they're certainly in tension. Women find themselves having to fulfill two seemingly incompatible roles in two Kantian realms. I say seemingly, because I think they're in tension, I don't think they're incompatible. As discursive beings, they're called to function as members in a yet-to-be-actualized kingdom of fellow rational beings, a kingdom where all are mutually recognized as ends in themselves, with equal responsibilities to voice the, those perspectives that they take to be objectively true, to encourage the voicing of counter-perspectives, and to submit to self-authorized universal norms for theoretical and practical reasoning. But as would-be wives and mothers, they are called to function as members in a much more concrete, 
more particular and private space of reasons, where they are uniquely assigned the role of inspiring suitors, spouses, and children to cultivate the moral sentiments and civil domesticity that is consistent with Kant's vision of the well-managed home. Excelling at this role, the second role, requires that women develop a keen sensitivity to the peculiar tastes and inclinations of those within her immediate circle. She must learn to adapt herself to these peculiarities and to become charming objects that are capable of exerting subtle, imperceptible influence over those in her care. Complacence is the term that Kant uses for the human inclination. He does think it's a human inclination, complacence to conform ourselves to the dispositions of significant others in our lives and to kindly acquiesce to their demands. Now, I mean, he, does, he thinks complacence is it's, it's, it's a good quality. <laughs> um, but he rejects the idea that complacence is a true virtue. Why? Because it can hinder us from taking a more universal perspective. But he maintains, on the other hand, that it's a beautiful, charming moral feeling and that women are especially called upon to cultivate it. Hegel similarly treats familial piety or loyalty as a distinctly feminine virtue. In short, women are encouraged, women aspiring to be wives and mothers are encouraged to become heteronymous, particularistic reasoners that are capable of silently influencing those within their private sphere. And this is why Kant and Hegel are rightly charged with promulgating an account of the virtuous woman, wife, and mother that makes it much less likely that women will exercise the capacities and virtues associated with objective reasoning. So the question for us is whether or not contemporary evangelical Christian complementary accounts place women in a similar double bind, dueling identities kind of situation. Um, and time, I had it, I had to ditch it. Um, suffice it to say that I think there is ample evidence, Google complementarianism and, um, on, um, and evangelical and it'll pop up. Um, there's evidence that some do and some don't. Um, and I can present um, that evidence for me if you'd like to. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a huge debate right now whether uh, among evangelicals whether the Bible supports um, an egalitarian or complementarian, but that's not really my point. Um, and I don't want to go off. My point is just this, whether or not complementarian accounts, I'm urging for objecti objectivity and certain kinds of dispositions. If it's the case that complementarian accounts um, end up discouraging women from practicing and exercising those virtues and capacities, then I've got a problem. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not arguing that women um, should be discouraged or anyone else should be discouraged from cultivating the Christ-like virtues of humility and submission. Um, I endorse the claim made in the book of James that exercising heavenly as opposed to earthly women, wisdom is knowing when a persistent, gentle, and silent doing of good works can speak volumes in a marriage and in most other contexts. Um, I haven't always learned that and exercised that kind of wisdom, but I, I think it's true. My point is simply that we cannot, or rather I cannot, argue for Kantian objectivity as a proper aim that at least some discursive practice ought to strive for. Fail to critique complementary accounts where the modes of reasoning and intellectual virtues that are associated with Kantian objectivity are coded as masculine or at least unfeminine. And then expect that those displaying so-called female virtues or ways of knowings will be recognized as epistemic peers in those practices. Now that's a big chunk of a sentence, but it, I, I hope you get the point. Um, if it's the case that it's it's unfeminine for women to vigorously defend what they take to be objectively true convictions, then um, in a discursive practice where that's considered what one has to do in order to acquire objective knowledge, <coughs> women are gonna be less inclined to be seen as, a, as epistemic peers and even see themselves as epistemic peers in that kind of a practice. Having explained briefly why the Kantian imperative to reason objectively is too often heard as the imperative to reason like a man, let me now explain why it can also be heard as a command to reason like a white European. In the critique of pure reason, Kant claims that all of our interests of reason can be boiled down to answering three questions. I love this. What can I know? What should I do? And what may I hope? His works in political philosophy, philosophy of history, anthropology, and the philosophy of religion are primarily targeted at addressing the third question, and it was indeed an urgent one. 
as early as the mid 1700s, so early on. So the idea that the Enlightenment were just a bunch of you know, naive optimists is just not tr the case. As early as the mid 1700s, and especially in the aftermath of the French reign of terror, German Enlightenment thinkers doubted that there was any hope that humanity was capable of intellectual or moral progress. Kant argued that without such hope, rational beings like us would have no rational motivation for equipping future generations to build a more just and more peaceful world community. That there at least had to be some rational, minimal, but rational hope that it was possible. To ground such a hope, Kant proposed writing a universal history that was specifically oriented by the practical aim of furthering cosmopolitan peace and justice. And in the last work published in his lifetime, he also wrote an essay entitled, A Renewed Attempt to Answer the Question, Is the Human Race Continually Improving? In these essays, Kant argues that a sufficiently rational, albeit conjectural, he says it's conjectural, <laughs> yes answer to the possibility of human improvement depends on writing a history of progressively civilized societies that appear on the world stage, such that one can detect the working of divine providence despite and even through the violence, selfishness, and folly that marks much of human history. Kant's proposed history was thus a kind of theodicy. He insisted that it must also aim at universality, taking as its subject matter all peoples and their recorded histories, but only insofar as these can be authenticated in the writings of the ancient Greeks. In other words, Kant claimed that the beginning of a providentially orchestrated history of humanity becoming more civilized starts in ancient Greek and with the first pages of Thucydides. While Kant proposed writing such a history, Hegel is infamous for having completed it. Hegel also incorporated a racial taxonomy that he and Kant, now I just, just found this out, and Kant is responsible for credited with first developing a modern scientific concept of race. I had no idea this was the case. Um, um, according to Kant, there were four races, um, and he based this um, division on the reports of European travelers traders, and Christian missionaries. So as one can well imagine, the result is a racialized, Eurocentric meta-narrative of progressively developed human reason. Consider these snippets from the notes of one of Hegel's students. Negroes, and I like Hegel, but this is the yucky part of Hegel. And um, this is actually from one of his students, but if you read uh, Hegel's own lectures um, on the philosophy of history, he says similar stuff. Negroes are to be regarded as a race of children who remain immersed in their state of uninterested naivete. They are sold and let themselves be sold without any reflection on the rights or wrongs of the matter. In the Asiatic race, mind is already beginning to awake, to separate itself from the life of nature. It is in the Caucasian race that mind finds, first attains to absolute unity with itself. Here for the first time, mind achieves self-determination, self-development, and in so doing, creates world history. This is why you all had to go through the stuff about autonomy and all of this, so you can see what is, what's actually being said here. Christian Europeans, in contrast to Caucasian Mohammedans, and I'm using his terminology, have for their principle and character the concrete universal self-determining thought. In this religious conception, Christianity, he says, the opposition of universal, in particular, of thought and being, is present in its most developed form, and yet has been brought back to unity. The moral of this story for both Kant and Hegel is that the discursive practices that are dominated by Caucasian European Christian thought constitute the most fully developed mode of objective reasoning. The hope for human progress rests then on assimilating non-whites, non-Christians, and non-Europeans into these practices. Thomas McCarthy, author of Race, Empire, and the Human Development, recaps their vision as follows. In law and politics, art and science, European developments will set the pace and provide models for the rest of the world. Ethical religious community, like legal political union, will arrive not through some form of dialectical or dialogical mediation of differences, but through the global diffusion of Western ways. My question then is whether the way I teach philosophy or a classical liberal arts education more generally does not inadvertently buy into a similar vision of assimilation. Now on the Kantian account 
of objectivity and objective discursive practices that I've been arguing for, it is essential that a diverse body of practitioners are encouraged to bring their distinctive embodied perspectives to the table, and that all practitioners, not necessarily students or um, apprentices, but once you're a practitioner, are granted, e so you guys don't get to go, come to the table. I, uh, I was really realizing this, you know, if I really push this, then I have no right to even grade their papers. Um, that all of them are granted equal intellectual authority, and that the convergence towards objectivity proceeds by a mediation of perspectival differences. 